Hi everyone. Thank you for joining Teledyne LaCroix today for our third oscilloscope coffee break webinar of 2023 with presenter John Schechter. Today's topic is all about rise time. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. To the right of your screen, you see the GoToWebinar control panel. Please use the questions section on this control panel to submit questions during today's presentation. We will hold a live Q&A at the end of the webinar to keep us running on time. This webinar is being recorded. A link to the recording will be sent to you automatically via email within the next 24 to 48 hours. Finally, as you exit today's webinar, a short survey will pop up. If you could take a, a minute to answer these five questions, uh, we would appreciate it. Uh, so just a little bit about us. Uh, LaCroix was founded by Alabama native Walter LaCroix in 1964. Uh, corporate headquarters is located in Chestnut Ridge, New York, but we have sales and service offices all across the United States, as well as the rest of the world. We make oscilloscopes, protocol analyzers, and related test and measurement equipment. Uh, in 2012, we were acquired by Te Teledyne Technologies and renamed to Teledyne LaCroix. Uh, thanks again for joining us. I will now turn things over to John to begin. Thank you for that introduction, and thanks everybody for joining today's webinar. My name is John, and I'm the product marketing engineer here at Teledyne LaCroix, and I'm the presenter of this year's Coffee Break webinar series. So today is part three of a 12-part webinar series on oscilloscope basics, where today we're going to be covering how rise time is related to bandwidth in an oscilloscope. You can see I listed the first six parts of this webinar series here on this slide and they occur on the last Thursday of every month. So you can be sure to register for all of them ahead of time using this link below. But for now, let's get into part three of this webinar series. How is rise time related to bandwidth in an oscilloscope? So the IEEE refers to rise time as the pulse transition duration. And essentially what this means is the time taken for your signal to cross from a specified low amplitude value to a specified high amplitude value, typically seen as 10 to 90% of the signal's amplitude. And when it comes to oscilloscopes, knowing your rise time is important for choosing how much oscilloscope bandwidth you need to capture your signal's rising edges. So if you remember in last month's webinar on oscilloscope bandwidth, one of the rule of thumbs we talked about for selecting oscilloscope bandwidth used rise time. And that rule of thumb stated that you should get an oscilloscope with bandwidth that is three times your signal's bandwidth, where signal bandwidth is roughly 0.4 divided by signal rise time. So for example, if we had a signal with a one nanosecond rise time, then that signal's bandwidth would be approximately 400 megahertz. And so following this rule of thumb, I'd recommend getting an oscilloscope that is three times the signal bandwidth, meaning you would need an oscilloscope with at least 1.2 gigahertz of bandwidth. Getting an oscilloscope with at least three times your signal's bandwidth will assure that the oscilloscope is not significantly slowing down your signal. So what I mean by the oscilloscope not significantly slowing down the signal is that your measurements of your signal is actually gonna be impacted by the oscilloscope you are using. And so you could see here that in the measured rise time equation, the rise time that we uh, measure for your signal is gonna be impacted by oscilloscope rise time. And so the higher oscilloscope bandwidth you have, the faster oscilloscope rise time, and the faster this oscilloscope rise time, the closer your measured rise time is to the signal's actual rise time. And so you get a more accurate measurement. So for example, again, looking at a signal with a one nanosecond rise time, if we were to capture that signal on an oscilloscope that had a rise time of 400 picoseconds, then plugging those rise time values into the equation, we would measure that signal to have a rise time of 1.07 nanoseconds, which is 7% slower than the signal's actual rise time of one nanosecond. And so when you're selecting a certain amount of bandwidth for your oscilloscope, it really comes down to what do you know about your signal's rise time and how accurately do you need to capture it? So I wanna open up a poll and ask you guys that question. Do you know your signal's rise time? We'll give you guys about a minute to answer this and 
Hillary, if you, uh, you don't mind letting me know when we could uh, close out this poll and I'll, I'll move on with the webinar. Yep, of course. Thanks. There we go. We got some people submitting their votes now. Great. Maybe it took a minute to get up a couple seconds. Okay. I'm going to close the poll. It looks like the majority uh, does know. So uh, I'll okay, close it. And I can share the results if you want. Uh, so sure. Looks like 72% yes and 28% no. Okay. All right, good to know. Thanks, everybody, for taking a minute to answer that. I'll move on now to the next slide. So I want to take a look at an example as to how oscilloscope bandwidth impacts the measured rise time we get for a signal. So again, let's look at a signal with a one nanosecond rise time, meaning its signal bandwidth is approximately 400 megahertz. And I wanna know what that measured rise time looks like on different bandwidth oscilloscopes. So you remember keeping this equation in mind, let's look at that 400 megahertz signal on a 350 megahertz oscilloscope and plugging in those respective rise time values into the equation, we would measure that signal's rise time to be 41% slower than the signal's actual rise time of, of one nanosecond. And so of course, you wouldn't want a, an oscilloscope with less bandwidth than your signal. So let's take a look at an oscilloscope with a little bit more bandwidth than your signal, um, 500 megahertz. So now plugging in those values of rise time for your signal and the oscilloscope into the measured rise time formula, we would measure that signal's rise time to be 22% slower than the signal's actual rise time of one nanosecond. And so you can see with the addition of just a little bit more bandwidth, we're able to cut our rise time error in half. Let's take a look at a one gigahertz oscilloscope, plugging in the respective rise time values into the equation. We would get a measured rise time that is 7% slower than the signal's actual rise time. And then finally, at two gigahertz, plugging in those values, we're getting a rise time error of 3%. And so the takeaway here is that when you have an oscilloscope with bandwidth that is at least two and a half times your signal's bandwidth, then you're really starting to minimize your rise time error. And if you know what your error tolerance is, maybe it's even less than seven or 3%, um, then you would want an oscilloscope with five, six, or maybe even seven times your signal's bandwidth. But it really depends on um, your error tolerances when it comes to um, measuring your signal's rise time. Now, if you don't know your error tolerances, then that three times signal bandwidth rule of thumb is considered a reasonable trade-off between rise time error and oscilloscope price. So for this 400 megahertz signal. On the last slide, um, we saw how you would want at least one gigahertz of bandwidth. And so the rule of thumb here is recommending getting a 1.2 gigahertz of bandwidth. So that's considered you know, a, a reasonable trade-off um, with error and price. Now, if you do know what your error tolerances are, then you don't need an oscilloscope to check what a rise time error would be on any given oscilloscope. All you need is to know your signal's rise time and then find any oscilloscope's rise time specification from any oscilloscope manufacturer's data sheet. Um, they all provide that specification. And you'd want to plug in your signal rise time and oscilloscope rise time into that measured rise time equation. And then you could calculate that rise time error, the difference between your measured rise time and your signal rise time, and then just choose any oscilloscope bandwidth class that would give you that rise time error that is acceptable for you. Now, when you are selecting oscilloscope rise time from a manufacturer's data sheet, 
I do want to warn you guys that there are a wide range of um, ways that manufacturers specify rise time and uh, specify any specification really on a data sheet. Uh, the first way is the best way, which is by actually measuring the oscilloscope's rise time and having a pass-fail limit that it must pass in order to be um, sold. And so this could be seen on a data sheet in parentheses labeled as a guaranteed specification. Uh, the second way is by specifying a typical value from a small subset of measurements from a product line. And so you'll see this in the data sheet called out as a typical specification. The third way that oscilloscope manufacturers can specify rise time is through an equation or some calculated formula using oscilloscope bandwidth. And the problem with that is that the oscilloscope manufacturer is making assumptions for you and sort of using that rule of thumb for you uh, without you knowing what those assumptions are. And so you'll see this labeled in the data sheet as calculated. And then finally, um, some oscilloscope manufacturers specify rise time and other specifications in a non-real-time operating mode. So you might see this labeled as equivalent time sampling mode, for example. And the reason this isn't ideal is because um, the specification is usually um, measured in an operating mode that you'll never really use for capturing your signals. And so it's not really giving you uh, insight into what your signal will experience when using the oscilloscope. And so of course, you would ideally want a guaranteed or typical value for rise time, but just be aware that some oscilloscope manufacturers have these other ways as well to specify it. So some closing thoughts here. I wanna reiterate that rise time is the time taken for your signal to cross from a specified low amplitude value to a specified high amplitude value, typically seen from 10 to 90% of the signal's amplitude. And knowing your signal's rise time uh, can give you insight into how much bandwidth you need in your oscilloscope. So again, signal bandwidth is roughly following this equation right here of 0.4 divided by signal rise time. And if you get an oscilloscope with at least three times the signal's bandwidth, then that's considered a reasonable trade-off between rise time error and price. Um, but if you do know your error tolerances when it comes to rise time, then you don't need an oscilloscope to calculate the uh, rise time error of any given oscilloscope. You just need to know your signal's rise time, find the oscilloscope rise time that's provided by your oscilloscope manufacturer, and calculate measured rise time and rise time error, and pick the oscilloscope that meets your requirements for rise time error. Now, the last thing I'll leave you guys with here today is that now that you're familiar with bandwidth and how rise time plays a role in um, helping you decide how much bandwidth you need in an oscilloscope, I want to quickly talk about the importance of sample rate uh, for capturing um, the rising edges of your signal. So if we had a signal that had a one nanosecond rise time and we were to capture that on a one gigahertz oscilloscope with the minimum amount of sample rate required, which in this case would be two and a half giga samples per second. And you can see we're not really getting the full range of the, uh, the um, signals rising edge here. Right? We're, we're sort, sort of cutting it short right here. So you can see that with the addition of more samples, we're able to capture more of our signals rising edge. Uh, we're gonna talk about why that's important in the next webinar in April. So where can you register for that webinar and others that you may be interested in? You could go to our website, teledynlacroix.com, click on the resources tab, and then events and training. Then you have the option from registering uh, to one of our upcoming webinars or view one of our on-demand webinars. In either case, there are a wide range of filters and search options that you guys can use to find any topics of interest. I also want to remind you guys about Maui Studio. Uh, Maui is the user interface for our oscilloscopes. And if you don't own a Teledyne LaCroix oscilloscope, then you could download Maui Studio onto your PC for a 30 day trial, a free trial, I should say. And it'll give you insight into what it's like to own a Teledyne LaCroix oscilloscope.
that about wraps up uh, part three of this webinar series. Uh, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. So thanks everyone for joining us. We appreciate it. John, great presentation as always. Um, there's a couple questions in the questions section if you're able to get to them. Otherwise, I'll just read them to you. It's up to you. Uh, can you read them? Yeah, of course. Um, so we have a question from Joseph. If I am looking at triggering on a current transition, how does the CT slash probe interact with the measurement and how would this be related to the bandwidth of the scope? Uh, hold on, let me open that question up actually. Um, can you say that one more time? You cut out. Yeah, Just if I'm looking at triggering on a current transition, how does the, I'm not sure what CT stands for, but CT slash probe interact with the measurement and how would this be related to the bandwidth of the scope? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question as it relates to CT. Maybe uh, we could connect offline if you want to shoot me an email and we could connect about that question. Okay. Um, just for the sake of time here. Okay. Um, and then we have another question from Joel. Uh, how would the jitter be affected by the oscilloscope jitter, even though the rise time is slower than the real one? Could you get a proper jitter measurement? I assume it would be increased by the oscilloscope jitter in the same way as the rise time is. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So Joel, I guess your answer is you are correct. Um, and then there's another question we have here. Um, <clears throat> which oscilloscope bandwidth rule of thumb should I be using? Is it three times the signal bandwidth or five times the fundamental frequency? Uh, that's a good question. I remember in um, one of the previous webinars, we did talk about that rule of thumb as well for uh, five times the fundamental frequency. Um, I guess my, my simple answer to this question would be that um, with uh, three times the signal bandwidth, you're, um, you're buying a more expensive oscilloscope than with five times the fundamental frequency. So it, um, it would ultimately come down to uh, your budget. If you, if you could afford to buy an oscilloscope with a bandwidth that is three times your signal's bandwidth, then uh, that's the rule of thumb that you should be using. Okay, um, and then the other question, uh, it looks like the last question is, why is the number in the sig signal bandwidth formula approximately 0.4? Uh, Bob has seen this formula use different values and how would he know which one to use? Okay, uh, yeah, so a few times here I write um, the, the formula here using 0.4, I have this approximately sim uh, symbol next to it. Uh, that's because uh, you're right, you could see this value be uh, um, seen differently um, in different places. So the reason I approximate it is because um, it really depends on the frequency response of your oscilloscope. So you'll see a higher value here if uh, your oscilloscope has a flatter frequency response. And you'll see a, a lower value uh, with that more traditional 3 dB roll off. So with, with a flatter roll off, you may have to use 0.45 and with that more traditional roll off, um, maybe 0 0.35, 0 0.38 is uh, typically used. But um, that's why I approximated as 0.4. Okay, Bob, hopefully that answers your question. If not, we'll take that offline as well. Um, and so I think that is it for today. Uh, we, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, check your email in about 24 to 48 hours for a copy to the on-demand. And we hope that you will join us for a future webinar. Uh, thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your week.